بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله وحده وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على من لا نبي بعده وعلى اله واصحابه اجمعين we praise allah subhanahu wa ta'ala we send blessings and salutations upon muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and all his household his companions may allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless them and grant them all goodness and may allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless every single one of us beloved brothers and sisters we were looking at how the kuffar of Quraysh, the disbelievers in Quraysh, had boycotted the Muslims. And I had made mention of several points. They said, we will not marry into them, nor will we allow them to marry into us. We will not deal with them, nor will we allow them to deal with us. We will not provide them any sustenance, anything at all that is of goodness for them. We're not going to sign a treaty with them, nor will we allow them to initiate that. And we are not going to mix with them, nor will we allow them to mix with us. We will not even sit with them, and we will not even talk to them, and we won't even allow them to enter our houses. These were some of the points that were written down and described for your information. The man who was writing it down, his name was Mansur ibn Ikrimah, according to some of the narrations, Later on, he actually became paralyzed on his hand. He couldn't write after that. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us. Remember one thing. When a person harms the friends of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Wallahi, there is very little hope for them. Because it is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who will retaliate instead of that particular person. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us and grant us goodness. So they had written this. And they had managed to get the Muslims into a place known as Shi'ab Abi Talib on the outskirts of Makkah to Al-Mukarramah. And for three years, the Muslims suffered. As we made mention of last night, they began to eat the leaves of the trees. And they were sucking on the roots of some of the shrubs in order to extract the water from there, the liquid from it. And they were roasting the skins, meaning the hide of the animals that they had already cut and trying to nibble on it in order to get whatever goodness was there. They became frail, they became sick, they became very, very weak and so on. It did not deter them, not at all, not at all. With us, imagine for three years, if we had to be boycotted completely, no food, no drink, I think three days later, we probably would give in. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala safeguard us. The reason I make mention of this is because we are spoiled and still we don't understand the gift of Allah. We have three meals a day and a lot of the times we have much more than we can actually eat. Take a look at the month of Ramadan. Today on our tables in the evening when we were opening the fast, didn't we have much more than we could consume? Allahu Akbar. That's a gift of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us conscious of his gifts. What had happened then, because it was becoming very difficult, the Prophet ﷺ told his companions they may go to Habasha or to Abyssinia. Once again, we made mention of this in a little bit of detail yesterday. And we said that there were 83 men and 18 women who left for Abyssinia at the time. And Ja'far ibn Abi Talib was the Amir of them. And Quraysh did not stop there. They sent Amr ibn al-As with a team of people to go to Najashi, the Negus of Abyssinia. And as we heard yesterday, he went and he told the Negus that there are a group of people here from the people of Mecca, from our people who have reneged from the religion of our forefathers and they are wanted back in Mecca and they are criminals and so on. They have come to your land to seek asylum, send them back. And these people had come with gifts, gifts to give the king, you know, to give this leader of Abyssinia. And after some time, this leader, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa had already told the Muslims he would be just. He's a Christian man. He will listen to you. He will not oppress you. So he had asked Ja'far ibn Abi Talib what he had to say. And after making it very clear as to why they were there and as to the ignorance they were in before and how they were blessed by Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa being sent to them with the highest level of character and conduct and the highest level of worship, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was to be worshipped alone. No sticks, no stones, no idols, no people, nothing besides Allah, besides the maker, besides the one that we will return to. So in Najashi, then he allowed them to stay and he told the people of Makkah to leave. The Quraysh, 
Amr ibn al-As was told to leave. And guess what? He was given back all the gifts to say, take all this away and carry on. Because I didn't do what you wanted me to do here. It's like you came to me with a bribe. Take it back, go away. Allahu Akbar. Today when people take bribes, Allah safeguard us. Even if they don't do your work for you, the bribe is eaten. Allahu Akbar. It's gone. May Allah safeguard us. Look at the honesty of the man. Because they did not get what they wanted, he gave everything back. He says, take this and carry on. That was a just ruler. The ruler of Abyssinia. Allahu Akbar. So they, they slept the night and they thought of a plan. We mentioned this yesterday. I'm repeating it today. They came back and said, do you know what? Oh, Negus of Abyssinia. These people blaspheme Jesus Christ. You know what? They say something very bad about Jesus. May peace be upon him. So he called Ja'far ibn Abi Talib and the Muslims and said, what do you people say about Jesus? So Ja'far ibn Abi Talib said, Abdullahi wa rasuluhu kalimatuhu alqaha ila maryama wa ruhum minhu. He is the worshipper of Allah, the slave of Allah, the messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The ruh, his soul was blown into the Virgin Mary, born without a father, miraculously. That's what we believe and so on. And he mentioned whatever he was taught about Isa, the Prophet Jesus, may peace be upon him. And subhanallah, what did Najashi do? When he heard that, he said immediately, that is exactly what we know about the Prophet Jesus, may peace be upon him. It's exactly what we know. Imagine, this was the authentic teachings of Christianity coming from Africa. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us all. So he asked Ja'far ibn Abi Talib to read some of the Quran. And as we heard yesterday, he read the verses, opening verses of the surah named after Mary, the Virgin Mary, may peace be upon her, the mother of Jesus Christ, may peace be upon him. <laughs> the story starts of Zakaria alayhi salatu wasalam and how he made the dua in old age that oh Allah I'm not going to lose hope in your mercy grant me male offspring and how then he had children and then Mary had a child as well and so on and the entire story of Isa alayhi salatu wasalam is mentioned but the opening verses were enough to make the tears of Najashi roll down his eyes. Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, revelation revealed to him that an Najashi and his men were crying when they heard the Quran. And the Quran says that they believed in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Although the Najashi, having accepted Islam, did not inform his subjects of it and his people of it, he kept it within. Later on, in the year 9 Hijri, according to some of the narrations, and some say the 8th of Hijra, Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu reports in a hadith which is in Sahih al-Bukhari that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said one day that I have been informed that Najashi, your brother, Ashama, that was his name was Ashama and Najashi is just the title. It's like a king. So Ashama and Najashi of Abyssinia has passed away your brother. Let us get up and read Salatul Janazah for him. And so they got up in abstention and they read Salatul Janazah for an Najashi. And that was evidence enough to prove that he was a Muslim. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us goodness and may he take us away in a condition of Iman. So these people, Amr ibn al-As went away. For your information, just something very interesting. Amr ibn al-As, he came back to Abyssinia sometime later in order to try his tricks. Sometime later, he came back and he spoke to the Najashi once again. And Najashi told him a few words. And it is reported that that is when Islam entered the heart of Amr ibn al-As. Islam entered the heart of Amr ibn al-As, which means within his heart, he already began to accept because he heard someone from Africa confirm that that is a Nabi. In fact, exactly what happened was he was told, he was told that 
the angel that came to Jesus and Moses is the same angel that has come to the man you are talking about, which is Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And this was witnessed by a man who lived very, very far away, who did not even see an Najashi, uh, sorry, who did not even see the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Now, some make mention of the fact that later on he went to Medina Munawwara and accepted in the hands of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that was Amr ibn al-As. But those who have made mention of the fact that he accepted Islam with an Najashi, there is something interesting. If that was the case, then it's the first time that a Sahabi accepted Islam at the hands of a Tabi'i. Have we thought of that? Because Najashi was a Tabi'i. He did not see Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So if the narration is valid, then this would have been the case. However, the more common narration is that he came back and later on he spoke to Khalid ibn al-Walid and just before the victory of Makkah, they had come in to Medina Munawwara and accepted Islam with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us goodness. So at that particular time, whilst the Muslims were being surrounded and they were boycotted and so on, Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu anhu was suffering so much so much suffering why because no one speaking no one dealing nothing happening he decided allah has given me permission to go to abyssinia let me go so on his way out as he is progressing going to abyssinia he meets a man who knew him his name was ibn dughunna this ibn dughunna stops him ya abu bakr where are you going he says i am now leaving my people they are troubling us they are not allowing us to follow and fulfill what we believe so now i'm going to habasha perhaps allah will open our doors there and so on he says no a man like you should not be going you are an honorable man you fulfill the rights of everyone your character and conduct is exemplary you help the widows and the orphans and you assist those in need. You do not lie and so on. Come with me. I will take you back to Quraysh and give them my guarantee that they will not harm you. And they should not harm you from my guarantee. So he went back with Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu anhu and he spoke to the leaders of Quraysh who agreed on one condition. They said this man must not worship Allah openly and he must not recite the Quran openly because we've got rid of all of them. They are all somewhere in, in Shi'ab Abi Talib and this man here is going to come and he's going to read the Quran aloud. Our daughters, our sons, our children, everyone is interested. They are already turning towards these words and we don't want these words to be uttered again. We've just managed to solve the problem. For your information, if you look at the list of names of Muslims, all these top chiefs, their children were involved. They were already Muslim. All the big boys, Allahu Akbar. Their children were already Muslim and members of their family, either brothers, sisters, somehow relatives, very close relatives, were all already within the fold of Islam. So they, they knew that something has, drastic has to happen to block it. Otherwise, we are dead. What was the problem? Why were they so worried? They were worried because they feared loss of power. They feared loss of wealth. They thought some authority is going to come above us and going to take us over and then we will lose all our dignity. They did not know Islam gives dignity. It does not take it away. Allahu Akbar. So Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu anhu was free. And later on, he in the house, he used to read salah outside in the little courtyard of his and people started flocking again. These people called Ibn Dughunna after some time and told him, look, this man is breaking the promise. So Ibn Dughunna came to him and told him, look, I gave you my guarantee. And I gave the same guarantee to the people of Quraysh about you. And now you are breaking the promise by reading the Quran outside. Everybody is coming to listen to it and people are coming. They don't want that. So either you stop it or I take back my guarantee. Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu anhu. What do you think he said? He said, take back your guarantee. Go back to them and tell them this I can't manage. So he went back. He took the guarantee. That is when they started harming Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu even physically the people of Quraysh began to usurp wealth because they had got the Muslims into Shi'ab Abi Talib so now their wealth was open they began to usurp things and oppress in a huge way until one day there was a group of people who saw in fact one man and his name was Hisham ibn Amr he was from Quraysh not a believer 
And he saw his relatives suffering because Ban al Muttalib and Banu Hashim were in Shi'ab Abi Talib being surrounded, boycotted, suffering, dying, and so on. And he says, this Hisham ibn Amr, he says to himself, I, we can't allow this to happen. Let me think of a plan. These are our brothers and sisters, our blood, our real family. How can this happen? He thought to himself, Abu Jahl, who is the one who came up with the idea of boycott, had we come up with the idea of boycott about his family, he wouldn't have followed us. So why must we follow him? Look at this man, not a Muslim. This is why Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, Inna Allah la yu'ayyidu hadha ad-deeni bil rajul al-fajir. That at times Allah grants or gives support and strength to the deen by a man who is sinful. Sometimes by a man who is not even a Muslim. The example of Abu Talib is cited. The example of these, this young man, what did he do? He went to one of his friends, Zuhair ibn Abi Umayyah. And he says exactly what he thought that look, look at these people, they are dying. We need to break this treaty. I'm ready to break it, this little covenant. I feel like going to the Kaaba and tearing it, ripping it to pieces in front of everyone. But I need one man to support me. So this man says, I'm with you. So now he went to a third man. And the third man was Al Mut'im ibn Adi. And he told Mut'im ibn Adi the same thing. I need a man's support to do this. I want to tear it, rip it apart. Aren't you feeling compassionate against, meaning uh, towards these people here? Don't you feel in your heart a little bit of mercy? He says, yes. So he says, okay, that makes now three of us. Allahu Akbar. And he went to another one, a fourth one. The fourth one was Abu al-Bakhtari ibn Hisham. And he tells him the same thing. Abu al-Bakhtari says, I'm with you. He says, now that makes four of us. Allahu Akbar. And he went to a fifth one. Look at this man and his tactic of thinking. If he were to announce it, it wouldn't have succeeded. But one by one, he went to those whom he trusts. And he spoke to them on humanitarian grounds. Subhanallah. Humanitarian grounds. He says, look, we need to break this. This is barbaric. How can you prevent people from eating? How can you prevent people from food and drink and they are your blood? How? So now they went to the final man, Zam'ah ibn al-Aswad, and the five of them agreed. So Zuhair ibn Abi Umayyah says, let's go to the Kaaba. And we pretend like we are not connected. And I will stand up in front of Abu Jahl and the others. And I am going to announce that this is oppression against Banu Hashim and Banu Muttalib. And I am going to get up and tear and rip this covenant which is on the Kaaba. And from today on, it's going to be broken. And when I say that, let's see what happens. You all come in one by one to support. So this was happening on one front. On the other front, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, three years have gone by. We want to let you know that the ants, the termites, have eaten the covenant. Nothing is left of it besides where the name of Allah was written. So it's eaten up in the Kaaba. It's in the Kaaba, but it's eaten up. The termite, the mite has eaten it. So he tells his uncle, oh my uncle, this is what has happened. The uncle says, are you sure? He says, Ma Allah has told me. Allah has told me. That's a guarantee. It's not wrong. So Abu Talib is now in the vicinity of the Kaaba preparing to tell these people. And in the meantime, this man gets up. Now, these are two narrations. We've brought them together. So this man, Zuhair ibn Abi Umayyah, he gets up and he makes his announcement. We want to break the covenant. We, I'm going to do this and do that. And Abu Jahl gets up and says, you dare touch it. So now Hisham ibn Amr gets up and says, what are you talking about? I agree with this man here. It is wrong. It is oppressive and so on. So Abu Jahl says, who you think you are? And the third one gets up and says, no, I also agree with these two. What they are saying is right. And then a few people get in and the fourth one comes and the fifth one comes. And then Abu Talib says, hang on. This covenant has been eaten by ants. And this was information given to my nephew by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And everyone is silent. They are silent. What is the silence? The covenant is eaten. So Quraysh get together quickly and they tell Abu Talib, okay, what if the covenant is not eaten? He says, if the covenant is not eaten, I hand you my nephew. I give him to you. That's all they wanted. They wanted him to execute him. I hand him to you. And if the covenant is eaten, the boycott stops immediately. They agreed and they struck that agreement properly. And then they look into the Kaaba. They see, lo and behold, it is completely eaten besides the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And these young boys were successful. And at the same time, the revelation that had come to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam as well was completely accurate subhanallah. Still, 
the boycott, mashallah, it had stopped immediately, but they didn't believe. And what is of irony is Abu Talib himself also did not believe yet. That's very ironic. And this goes to show that sometimes when Allah has not written guidance for someone, it will never come. It's our teaching. We are taught by Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to constantly say, Allahumma ya muqallib al qulub thabbit qulubana ala deenik. Oh Allah, oh Allah, who turns the hearts, the one who owns the turning of the hearts, turn our hearts upon the right path, not away from it. Because Allah owns the hearts. We say, Ihdina sirat al mustaqim, guide us to the straight path, because guidance is in the hands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If Allah seals the hearts, who is going to guide those hearts thereafter? So may Allah open our doors. Some people see the light, they see it bright, shining, but they don't want to take heed and they don't want to learn lesson. So this was revelation from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and these boys, subhanallah, these youngsters of Quraysh, they had succeeded and the, the boycott was over. And now the people of Quraysh began to persecute the Muslims once again, a very, very great degree. And what had happened at that particular point, Allah blessed Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam with a blessing. The people of Najran, Najran was a distance from Makkah to Al-Mukarramah. They were predominantly Christian people. They had heard about this messenger and they decided to send a group of people, mashallah, to go and see this man and to get news and to see whether he is right or wrong. So the Christians of Najran sent 20 men to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam when they had come out of the boycott. And they came and asked him questions. And they asked him, they heard some of the Quran asking him questions. All 20 accepted Islam. One go. Allahu Akbar. They all accepted. Look, the people of Quraysh did not accept, but people from far away came and accepted. This is what happens to the Anbiya of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Their own people boot them out. This is what Waraqa bin Nawfal said. When you come with this message to your people, they're not going to listen to you. But the others further away will benefit from it much, much more than your own people. May Allah grant us really a lesson. I always like to make mention of the ulama of your area. Every time there are ulama in your midst, make use of them. If you don't make use of them, there will be others further away who will be making use of them and you will go without any form of goodness, without having benefited. When you meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He will ask you, I kept so and so and so and so right near you as your neighbors. How you, did you not benefit from them? They had the message. You didn't even get the message. So ensure that you make use of the ulama in your midst. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us. May Allah open our doors. The lesson we have just learned is from what happened. The people of Najran came. What about the people of Makkah? His own family rejected Allahu Akbar. His own uncle and the others. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala not prohibit us. So Abu Jahl looks at these people of Najran and he says, you people are mad. How can you have come here, ask one, two questions and you accept when we live here and we know this man and we, we will never accept. So immediately Allahu Akbar, they responded. They said, look, we have our choice. We have chosen. You have your choice. You've chosen. And you know what? We don't want to debate with someone who's a fool. And Allah revealed verses to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. وَإِذَا سَمِعُوا اللَّهُ وَأَعْرَضُوا عَنْهُ وَقَالُوا لَنَا أَعْمَالُنَا وَلَكُمْ أَعْمَالُكُمْ سَلَامٌ عَلَيْكُمْ لَا نَبْتَغِي الْجَاهِلِينَ When they hear the foolish person, when they hear that which is vain, what Abu Jahl was saying, when they hear that which is vain, they turned away from it, they turned away from it. And they said, we have our deeds, our choice. You have your deeds, your choice. And peace be upon you. We are not going to waste our time debating and arguing with you. So this verse was revealed in connection with the group that had come from Najran and what debate or what little discussion they had had with Abu Jahl. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us lesson. Then Allahu Akbar, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes mention of something very, very powerful connected to Something that had happened that was very sad on one hand and the other hand, a lesson for all. The uncle of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam fell ill. He fell sick. And Quraysh, 
They were happy and they were sad. They were happy and they were sad. They were sad thinking this man is going to accept Islam last minute. And they were happy because they thought to themselves, once he's gone, we can nail this man as we like. Allahu Akbar, may Allah protect us. This nephew, he was being protected by the uncle. The uncle dies, we can do whatever we want with this nephew. So they made sure they were around Abu Talib on his deathbed. He was now very old and sickly. And the Prophet, peace be upon him, who loved his uncle a lot, meaning he had great care for his uncle, his uncle cared for him. But when Islam came, he continued trying to convey the message of Islam to his uncle. His uncle knew what was right and wrong, but he had not uttered the shahada. He didn't declare, declare it. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us not only the utterance of shahada, but the belief and the ability to convey it to others. Amen. So his uncle, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa looks at him and says, Ya am, qul kalimatan uhaju laka biha yawm al qiyamah. I want you to utter one statement so that I can fight your case on the day of Qiyamah. Allahu Akbar. You utter one statement and the rest is mine, so to speak. Say one word, I will bear witness on the day of Qiyamah that you have uttered it. Just say that there is none worthy of worship besides the Maker and the one you are going to return to. Just say that. Once you utter that, I will do the rest for you. Allahu Akbar. Because you need to turn away from the idols and all what Quraysh was worshipping and you need to come to the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But the uncle he actually tells his nephew, oh my nephew, had it not been for these big boys around me, meaning the big people of Quraysh around me, I would have made you so happy by that statement. But if I now say it on my deathbed, it's going to be a great embarrassment. I will go down as a traitor in history. Look at this. This is what the man says. If it wasn't for Quraysh around here, I would be uttering. And Quraysh was waiting, meaning the head... They were waiting there because they knew we don't want tomorrow to hear that on his deathbed he became a Muslim and we didn't know. So we want to bear witness we are going to be here right here. So the Prophet ﷺ was very sad because he kept repeating this. That oh my uncle utter one statement. Just say la ilaha illallah and I will bear witness for you. Muhammadur Rasulullah ﷺ. But the uncle passed away. When the uncle passed away without having uttered these words, the Prophet ﷺ was very, very sad. Very, very sad. And this is when verses were revealed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You do not guide whomsoever you wish. O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, we guide. Allah guides whomsoever he wishes. Subhanallah. So guidance is not in your hands. Guidance is in the hands of Allah. In your hands is to show the path. Whether they walk on it or not is up to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You see, hidayah is divided into two categories. Like Allah says, وَإِنَّكَ لَتَهْدِي إِلَىٰ صِرَاطٍ مُسْتَقِيمٍ O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, you guide them to the straight path, which means you show them where the path is. But the guidance as in the ability to walk on that path, that's only in the hands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So let's not confuse the two types of guidance. One is الدلالة والإرشاد. The other one is التوفيق, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives acceptance to a person to walk on the path. A lot of us know what is right and wrong. But a lot of us are guilty of slipping here and there and doing that which is wrong and not doing that which we are supposed to. So this happens. May Allah forgive us and make us strong. So to know what's right and wrong is one thing. But to walk on that path is another thing. So this was also a verse that was revealed to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Now there was a very, very difficult time that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had gone through. Very difficult because his uncle passed away. The people of Quraysh began they already threatened, now we're going to kill this man. And do you know, Abu Talib was the external support, which means he protected Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam from any external harm by the will of Allah. But something else happened. Khadija bint Khuwailid radiallahu anha, who was the closest to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, his own wife, who was the biggest pillar of support and comfort, she also fell ill and passed away. Khadija radiallahu anha. This was in the 10th year of Hijrah. It became known as the year of sadness because one after the other negativities came into place. What we would term negativities. But Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, although he was sad, he knew Allah's plan. He was a Nabi. 
And he knew there is a plan. He knew that these words and this message have to go across wherever there are human beings, wherever there are mankind or jinn kind, the message is definitely going to reach. He lost his uncle. He lost his wife. The uncle, as I said, protected him from external harm. The wife protected him internally, comforted him. So he lost that inner comfort and the outer comfort zone that he had had all along. This was a test. Let the power of media improve your connection to your deen and make a positive impact on your life. Download the One Islam TV app today and embark on a transformative journey of knowledge, inspiration, and spiritual growth. Mm -hmm.